Okay, so let's talk about the first order necessary condition for optimality for the dynamic for the PMP maximum for the dynamic optimization problem, which is also known as Pontryagin maximum principle. So <clears throat> we have calculated in the previous class. Uh, what the derivative of the aggregate cost is as a function of individual actions throughout the horizon. And now what I'm going to do is introduce this notion of Hamiltonian so that you can actually write down the first order necessary conditions for optimality pretty in a very, very straightforward manner. And then we will talk about the back propagation. Oh, actually, I've already talked about back propagation. So I'll just write the back propagation algorithm in terms of Hamiltonian. So here is how you define Hamiltonian for the system. So H of t depends on xt. Maybe I should write it below. Depends on xt, ut and pt plus 1 and this is given by ct of xt ut plus so this is the running cost at time t the co-state vector at the next time step multiplied by ft. Okay, so this is the definition of Hamiltonian. It's just like Lagrangian. It's some definition based on the running cost and the state transition function. Now, this is the first order necessary conditions for optimality. Let u star t be the optimal control actions and define the optimal trajectory. This is the optimal trajectory. So when we say trajectory, it's usually trajectory of the state. And when we say action, it's just the action. So I have u star t, which is optimal action, x star t, which is the optimal trajectory. Then the first order necessary condition is ut of j of u is equal to gradient of ut of ht at, oh, this should be u star, x star t, u star t, p star t plus 1 is equal to 0. Where? P star T satisfies X.
okay so the key thing to note is that the gradient of j with respect to ut is the same as gradient of hamiltonian with respect to ut okay this is what we had computed in the previous class this is where we ended the previous class and now all we are doing is saying well the gradient of u of j should be equal to 0 but because this is equal to the gradient of Hamiltonian we just require the gradient of Hamiltonian to be equal to 0 and then the update equation for the co-state vector can be given by the gradient of Hamiltonian with respect to xt okay so just be uh, careful here I am taking the gradient of ht with respect to ut here I am taking gradient of ht gradient of ht with respect to xt in order to define the co-state vector so this particular vector this gradient is of the same dimension as the dimension of ut this gradient is of the same dimension as dimension of xt any question so far what's the gradient of Hamiltonian with respect to PT or PT plus 1 FT. right it is FT right so not not something related to the statement of the first order necessary condition but just something to to remember xt plus 1 star is gradient of ht with respect to pt plus 1 it doesn't affect the result of the first order necessary condition but actually the, the, the cool thing here is that x star t plus 1 is gradient of Hamiltonian with respect to the co-state vector and co-state vector is gradient of Hamiltonian with respect to state. That's just a cute observation. And that also explains the term why it's called a co-state vector, right? So it's like a state vector but not really a state so it's a co-state vector any questions so far everyone understood where this result comes from this is just the first order necessary condition for unconstrained optimization um, and we are just using the first order necessary condition from that this was this is basically covered in lecture I don't know lecture 5 I guess and we are revisiting lecture 5 in lecture 30 okay now the other cute observation that is not obvious by looking at these expressions is as follows so this is something that you will never find in in books but it is still true so I'm going to write that observation here is, has everyone noted this part down okay <coughs> remember we had talked about the fact that I can look at this optimization over capital T time steps either as an unconstrained optimization which is what we have done so far or as a constrained optimization of this type I want to minimize j of u with respect to u and the vector x so I want to minimize this uh, objective function 
Maybe I should also write it as a function of x. I guess I'm going to abuse the notation here. And I will write it as a function of both x and u. But now I have a constraint because of the state transition function. So I'm going to write it as f1 of x1 u1 minus x2 equals to 0, f2 of x2 u2 minus x3 equals to 0, and ft of xt ut. Okay, so all I have done is instead of considering that unconstrained optimization problem that required a lot of, I mean, we, we spent like a couple of lectures on that uh, in order to get to this particular equation. Okay, so we spent a lot of time trying to get to this equation and get to this first order necessary conditions for optimality. We might have as well said two classes back that, hey, look, why don't we just assume that I'm not just optimizing u, but I'm also optimizing x. But I put a set of constraints on the set of x's so that it follows the state transition function. Okay, I could have done that. And now it looks like a constraint optimization problem that we are all familiar with, right? How do we solve this kind of problem? How do we come up with a necessary condition for this problem? This is an optimization with equality constraints. What theorem is necessary? What, what theorem provides the necessary conditions for optimality for this, this particular situation? Yeah. Lagrange multiplier theorem. So I can apply Lagrange multiplier theorem here. But there is a catch. What, what is required for Lagrange multiplier theorem to be applicable? Anyone remembers? If x star or x star u star is optimal and and something. Yes. X star is a regular point. Right. So x star was a regular. So here I'm optimizing over both x star and u star, uh, x and u. So if x vector comma u vector is a regular point, then I can apply Lagrange multiplier theorem to come up with first order necessary conditions for optimality. It turns out, and it will take some effort, so I'm not doing it in the class, but it turns out that every point x comma u Oh, sorry, x comma u is a regular point, and therefore Lagrange multiplier theorem is applicable. Therefore, there exists a sequence of Lagrange multipliers which satisfies that complicated expression. Okay, now what do you think is the Lagrange multiplier for these constraints? What's the Lagrange multiplier here? So P2 star is the Lagrange multiplier here, P3 star is the Lagrange multiplier here, and P T plus 1 star is the Lagrange multiplier here. Okay, so the co-state vector becomes Lagrange multiplier for this constrained optimization problem. So no matter which way we had tried to approach this problem, we would have come to the same conclusion that this holds. 
okay? We would have come to exactly the same conclusion, except that these co-state vectors would now be Lagrange multipliers rather than co-state vectors. But the values are the same, the assumptions are the same, there's no difference whatsoever. Okay, so in this case, I just want to make a note, all points are regular. So we can apply Lagrange multiplier theorem. Now another thing is, now that you know you can view them as constrained optimization problem, you can use all the algorithms that we have studied for solving constrained optimization problem to solve this problem, okay? So back propagation algorithm is just one way to solve this, optimi this dynamic optimization problem. That's just, there's only one, al that, I mean, Back propagation is just one algorithm. You can apply a method of multipliers, you can apply sequential quadratic programming, you can apply barrier method, no, barrier method requires inequality constraints. You cannot apply barrier method. But you can apply all sorts of methods that we have studied so far for solving this problem, noting that these are Lagrange multipliers in, in, if you view it as a constrained optimization problem. So just something to uh, think about that the whole world of algorithms is now open to you once you recognize this fact. You, you're not slave to backpropagation algorithm. You can do whatever you want for solving this constraint optimization problem. You know what I do not know? because I have not done too deep of a study for this class of algorithms. What I do not know is, if you look at the training for neural networks, the first algorithm you learn is backpropagation algorithm. What I do not know is, can you come up with a new training algorithm for neural networks using, say, method of multipliers by applying this particular, uh, like by just viewing the problem as a constrained optimization problem. I just don't know, I've never tried. And I've never tried to look into the literature whether that is possible or not. But certainly, it can be done. Okay. Now, the other thing, important point to note, in your assignment uh, six, which is sort of ongoing assignment right now, and due after Thanksgiving, I am asking you to derive the backpropagation algorithm for solving neural, for optimizing, no not for optimizing, for finding the optimal weights for neural network using this approach, okay? So you have to derive that expression in your assignment six. So you will get some practice on deriving back propagation algorithm. Okay, and now let me just tell you what back propagation algorithm, oh I have already told you what the back propagation is. So wherever in the back propagation algorithm I had used the gradient of J, you can replace it with gradient of ut of ht, okay? That's the only change I'm going to make with respect to the algorithm we have talked about in the previous class. And that's because these two terms are exactly the same. Okay, any questions so far? Okay. All right. So if you work on real-time optimization in any system, whether it's a vehicle, whether it's a building, whether it's a rocket, you are quite likely to use the backpropagation algorithm we just talked about.
okay all right so next topic is dynamic programming So dynamic programming is actually, uh, let me start with a very simple thought experiment. I have a point A, I have a point B, and it's a two-dimensional plane, and I want to go from A to B, covering the shortest distance. What is the shortest distance between A and B? Straight line. So this is the shortest distance. Okay, so visually, I know that this is the shortest distance. This is what we have studied in our high school. And it turns out to be true. Now let's look at alternate paths from going from A to B. So I can take this path. I can take this path. It looks like an ice cream now. Uh, so I can take multiple paths to go from A to B. Um, what exactly is very special about this path, which is not special about these two paths? Like some property that is satisfied by the first, by this particular path, the straight line path, in comparison to this path and this path. What's that property? Okay, so go back in 1950s and ask yourself this question. What is so, why is it that this particular path is optimal, whereas this path and this path is not optimal. So let's try to continue with this thought experiment. Why is this path optimal? So let me pick some points along these paths. So let's say I have reached this point C1, C2, and C3. So three of us went along three different paths in order to get to B. And, and I've reached, so, so let's say I have reached C1, you have reached C2, and your friend has reached C3. And we still want to go to B, okay? That's our goal. Now the question is as follows. Does this person, has an incentive to change the path. So instead of going along this curved path, does he have any incentive to change its path? And the answer is yes. Instead of taking this curved path, he can take this straight line path. Right? And that's going to be shorter. So if he instead went along this path, and instead of going along this curved path, he took this straight line path to B, He's going to cover a shorter distance, and therefore, that is going to be optimal. For C2, there is no incentive to change the path. So there is an incentive to change. And in these two cases, no incentive to change. Right? All of you agree with it? Okay. I see some nodding heads, so I guess all of you agree with my conclusion so far. Now let's consider another path, uh, sorry, another point, D1, D2, D3. And let's ask the same question. Does this person have an incentive to change its path while it's going to be? And the answer is yes. So person one and person three, they have an incentive to change their path. So D, D1 can take this route to get to B optimally, and D3 can take this route to get to B optimally. Whereas D2 has still no incentive to change its path. It has fixed the path, it, it, it fixed the path, and then it's going along that path. It doesn't have an incentive to change the path. 
So what does that tell me about the optimal path of going from A to B? Well, it tells me the following fact. No matter where I stand and I do the optimization for the rest of the time horizon, I shouldn't have any incentive to change my path, change my course of action. Okay, so no change in incentive here, no change in incentive here, and no change in incentive here. And this particular fact of optimal strategy or, or computing optimal strategy is known as Bellman's principle for optimality. Bellman's principle of or for? Of optimality. Bellman's principle of optimality. Off or for? I think it's off. I'm tempted to check Wikipedia whether it should be off or for for optimality. Let me check. of optimality. Okay, so I've written it correctly. Okay, so what is Bellman's principle for op of optimality? So I have a dynamic optimization problem. And I have the strategy or control policy. Gamma T that maps xt to ut. So it's a policy that maps the current state to action. And I have an objective function j of gamma 1 to gamma capital T, which is summation ct xt ut. Or I, maybe I shouldn't write it here. I should write it as gamma t of xt. So that's my objective function that I want to minimize by picking an appropriate control policy. Control policy is sometimes called, this kind of policies are sometimes called feedback policies or feedback control or control strategy, so all of these are equivalent names for this map. And what the Bellman principles for, Bellman's principle of optimality says is if, no, not if, the theorem gamma 1 star to gamma t star is optimal if and only if the truncated policy gamma t star all the way up to gamma capital T star is optimal for summation of CS, S equals to T to capital T plus CT plus 1. That is Bellman's principle of optimality.
Okay. So let's apply this particular theorem, Bellman's principle of optimality. I, I, I may be wrong about the exact date, but somewhere around 1952, this theorem was discovered by Bellman. And actually before 1952, this exact theorem was discovered by Isaac in 1949 in a confidential note. So because it was a confidential document, nobody knew about it. But in 1952, Bellman rediscovered it. And so it's called Bellman's principle of optimality. But in fact, it was discovered slightly before 1952 by, uh, in, a, in a classified report by Isaac. Okay, <clears throat> so this is the Bellman principles of optimality. Now let's apply it here. So person one, so this is person one, this is person two, and this is person three. So person one, two, and three, they set out on a path to get to point B, starting from point A. And they all figured a policy, control policy, gamma t, which suggested that they should take this route. So person one should take this route. Person two, two sh should take like the straight line route. And person three should go to some intermediate point and then go to B. Now what does this Bellman principle of optimality say? Well, gamma one star to gamma t star is optimal if and only if, if and only if. So it's both sufficient and necessary condition for optimality if and only if the truncated policy gamma t star to gamma capital T star is optimal for the truncated cost, okay? This is the truncated cost. This cost starts from time t, goes all the way up to capital T, and then you add the terminal cost here. So this truncated policy is optimal for the truncated cost. And as we have argued in this case, this person two has no incentive to deviate no matter where it stands. Person one has an incentive to deviate at all the points. Person three has no incentive to deviate from this point onwards, but it has an incentive to deviate in this particular region, okay? Oh, I should say if the truncated policy is optimal for all t, for all t, so, this guy has an incentive to deviate all the time. This guy has no incentive to deviate any time. And this guy has an incentive to deviate in this window. But after this window, it has no incentive to deviate. OK? So therefore, path 1 is not optimal, path 3 is not optimal, but path 2 is optimal. Because there is no incentive to deviate no matter what. Yes, please. Xt is equal to? No, in theorem. Right. Yeah, you want to this to call it for all t. For all t and for all xt. For all xt, because you can start from anywhere at time t. You can start from any point in the space. So for all xt. That's right. That that's true for that that is basically that's how the opposite way is proved because if it holds for all t then in particular it holds for time t equals to 1. So that part is easy, the other part is difficult. Okay? And we are not going to do the proof in the class, but the other part is where most of the difficulty arises in proving the result. <coughs> okay? All right. Now let's let's dissect this particular theorem a little bit. I am interested in computing this strategy. Okay, I, I'm I'm interested in computing the optimal strategy or optimal policy. The only way I can find so so now I have an algorithmic technique to find the optimal policy which is, I find the optimal truncated policy. But how should I find the optimal truncated policy 
given that if this is hard, finding gamma 1 star all the way to gamma t star is hard, then I am assuming that starting from gamma t star all the way to gamma capital T star is also going to be hard, it is not going to be easy. But what I note here is that this should be true for all t. In particular, I can pick this small t to be equal to capital T and I can just focus on computing gamma capital T star, okay, which is optimal for C capital T plus C capital T plus 1. So, let us compute gamma capital T star first. How should I compute it? So gamma t star of x t x capital T is going to be min over u capital T in whatever space u t resides in c capital T of x t u t plus c capital T plus 1 f capital T x t u t. Oh, this is not min, but this is arg min. Okay, so I look at the truncated cost at time t and t plus 1 and I substitute x capital t plus 1 with the uh, state transition function. So now everything is in terms of x t and u t. I do the argument and I get gamma star, gamma t star as a function of x t. So I have computed gamma star t, gamma star capital T. Now this theorem suggests, so, and, and this was easy by the way, this, is, this, is, this looks very, fairly easy to, to do, to solve. So now let me, I am very encouraged by this, this idea. So instead of looking at, because I have to solve it for all t, let me now look at capital T minus 1. But now the question is, I have to compute gamma star capital T minus 1 and gamma star t together and that is a bit of a problem because I cannot compute two different policies at the same time. So what should we do? How should we compute two different policies? So I have already computed gamma star t. Now I want to compute gamma star t minus 1. But but then this says that that should be optimal for the rest of the rest of the for the truncated cost function. So here is an idea that we can apply. Let me store the minimum value of this optimization as a function v capital T of x t And this is known as a value function. So I computed the arg min, I stored it in gamma star, I computed the min, I stored it in V sub V capital T. Now, computing gamma star t minus 1 is easy because I can do 
argument of u t minus 1 Okay, so I know that this is the optimal truncated cost because I have stored that optimal value in this function V capital T. So all I have to do is in order to compute gamma star T minus 1, I have to add the running cost with this value function V capital T which contains the optimal value until the end of the decision horizon. And I can do the minimization and I can compute gamma star T minus 1. And what the, what the theorem would say or, or like a, a, a result would say is that this gamma star t minus 1 and this gamma star t is optimal for the truncated cost at time t minus 1. And now I have to compute the same thing for ta time t minus 2. So I will again define vt minus 1 as the minimum and I can proceed in an iterative fashion. Okay, so iteratively what you do is you define gamma t star of xt as argument of ct plus vt plus 1 and then vt of xt would be min of the same function. And another theorem again by Bellman is gamma t star gamma capital T star obtained using above using recursion above is optimal for summation Cs So because this holds true, this is something that one can prove by using induction. So you can prove this by induction and what this would tell you is that once you reach time t equals to 1, it's the optimal strategy for the entire problem, for the entire decision problem. Okay, so this leads to what is known as the dynamic programming algorithm. So in dynamic programming algorithm, you start with a terminal time, capital T, 
and you do the you conduct the optimization for the capital T step then you go back one step okay it's a recursive scheme you go back one step this VT which you computed at the terminal time step now appears in the new optimization problem you are solving at time t minus 1 okay and the same thing you computed V capital T minus 1 this would go in the next time step problem optimization problem and finally you will have V2 and then you will add C1 to it and optimize and get the optimal policy at the first time step at gamma at time t equals to 1. This is a recursive scheme it's called dynamic programming algorithm and and it computes the optimal solution optimal control policy for the dynamic optimization problem that we started with. One thing that is obvious by looking at these uh, expressions is it is computing a closed loop policy. It's computing an optimal feedback policy or optimal closed loop policy in comparison to the PMP approach that was computing the optimal open loop policy. It was computing U1 star all the way to U capital T star, whereas this one is computing gamma 1 star all the way up to gamma capital T star. So why wouldn't someone want to use this algorithm? Why don't we launch rockets using this algorithm? Why do we use PMP, Pontiagin Maximum Principle, for launching rockets into space? What's the trouble with this algorithm? This seems to be pretty sophisticated and is able to compute the optimal policy why should we not use this? So remember, we need this function to use here, right? How do you compute a function of something that, is, that can be anywhere in the space? So I have a minimization problem to solve for every xt. Now, how many xt's are there in Rn? Infinitely many. So I have infinitely many xt's. And for each xt, I have to solve an optimization problem an unconstrained optimization problem and I have to store that value, the optimal value and I have to store the argmin in gamma star t. So I have to store it for every xt and there are unlimited, there are in, infinitely many xt's in the space. Do we have a computer that can store infinitely many values? None so far, okay. We don't have computers that can store infinitely many values do we have computers that can compute infinitely many optimization problems at the same time? No, we don't have any computer that can solve this argument for every value of xt um, and store it in terms of gamma t and vt. So we don't have a way to solve this problem unless the number of states is finite, unless you are looking at only finite state, finite action problem. Then doing this recursion may make sense. It may still be very complicated, but it will still make sense. But when you have infinitely many states and infinitely many actions, doing this optimization will take a very, very long time. Uh, sorry, I shouldn't say solving the optimization problem. You can never solve the optimization, but you can at least approximately solve the optimization. But even that approximate solution will take you hundreds of years to compute for a reasonable problem. So what should we do? Uh, what that means is this algorithm, even though conceptually it is elegant, it's going to give me closed loop solution. It just turns out that it is infeasible to implement this algorithm on a modern computer 
because of these reasons, because we cannot really solve the argument for so many states and do the same process again and again for, for all the way from starting from capital T all the way to uh, time t equals to 1. So if you're launching a rocket in the space and your capital T would be of the order of one hour or two hours, and let's say you're optimizing, you're sending commands to the rocket engines every one second, uh, you have like 7,200 time steps. Capital T is 7,200. So I have to solve this problem 7,200 number of times in order to compute the optimal strategy, optimal policy, and that's why you cannot use it for launching rockets because it's very complicated. Okay, implementing this algorithm in real time in embedded systems is very complicated. So what we are going to do next, now that we have learned about dynamic programming, is I'm going to solve a simple problem using dynamic program, maybe a couple of simple problems. In, oh, Wednesday's class is not there because you have midterm on Wednesday. So on Friday, I'm going to uh, solve a couple of simple problems using dynamic programming to show how you can apply it for simple problems. And then in the next week and the week after that, we are going to spend a lot of time talking about approximate dynamic programming, which is a class of algorithms which tries to simplify the dynamic programming problem so that you can actually implement it in real world systems. So we'll talk about those problems in the subsequent classes. Thank you. And uh, best of luck for midterms. <laughs>